Ari, fantastic to get you back on Real Vision. And it's the first time you and I have actually sat down and chatted. You've been on Real Vision a few times now. Uh, just once, I think, with uh, Ash Bennington, which I'm actually going to be uh, repeating fairly soon uh, with, with him. But uh, it's very much a pleasure to, to chat with you. So, listen, I'd love, firstly, just give people an introduction about yourself, what you do, and then we'll go dig back in the past a bit and, and get to how you got here. Sure, sure. So, uh, currently, I'm, I'm co-founder and, and uh, I, I run Block Tower Capital with my, my co-founder, Matthew. Uh, I'm CIO, he's CEO, so we kind of, as many hedge funds function, we kind of split uh, the investment firm down the middle in terms of who manages what. Um, and as an investment firm, we, we really look at the entire cryptocurrency kind of opportunity set and try to be opportunistic and thoughtful about, about how to maximize um, what we can do in the space. Uh, and that, that can mean VC style underwriting of equity, it can mean liquid asset trading, uh, trading options and other types of derivatives. Uh, so we're very open, open minded and opportunistic. So how the hell did you get into this? How the hell did you get into Bitcoin? I guess that's where we start off. But what was your entry point? Talk me through that. Yeah, I, something I like uh, posting publicly because it's it's a it's a humbling and, and a reminder to, to be humble. Uh, so in 2011, one of my smartest friends uh, who was a bond investor at uh, PIMCO at the time, he emailed me two sentences. There was a, a 2011, uh, I think it was in I forget if it was New York Times or New Yorker, but it was a piece on Bitcoin. And he said, this looks interesting. And I responded definitively in 2011, a digital currency will never have value because value comes from either a long history of value like gold or uh, fiat backed by guns. What, what, were was, doing, what were you doing at this point? What, what I was a you? trader at Susquehanna International Group, uh, oh, which okay, is a right. really big market making firm. I was doing uh, options market making as well as some kind of prop trading. Um, so that was my 2011 answer. Uh, 2013, I traded another email with the same guy where I, I was looking at, at Bitcoin and uh, 2013, I didn't buy it partly because of Mt. Gox. It just looked scary to me. And I wasn't yet a believer, but I was like, oh, maybe I'll speculate in this. And I'm like, ah, this is too hard. And I wrote him that this looks like a classic bubble. And if it survives the collapse of Gox, uh, that will be meaningful. That will be interesting. And then, sure enough, you know, 2014 happened, Bitcoin was making lows, we had Silk Road taken down, we had Mt. Gox fail. And I thought that might be the end of Bitcoin, but when it wasn't, um, I, I've, I was a fan of Soros and some of his uh, mental models around things, around bubbles and around kind of asset cycles. And something he always said is that when events should kill an asset, but don't, take notice. That, that's very meaningful. And um, so that was kind of my framing in 2014 that, wow, everything just went wrong for Bitcoin, right? You had Silk Road, which is the biggest use case. You had the largest exchange. Uh, and yet there's a there's a floor here. There's still a bid. There's still usage. That's really interesting. So um, I think my entry follows a lot of people who get into it from the financial side, which is initially total dismissal, then skepticism and a little bit of participation. So I, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2014 and uh, traded a little bit. It didn't really have conviction. And then I think as often happens, you experience a full cycle and it's that that kind of really turns you into a true believer because uh, you have more time to research and learn and understand, but also experiencing the boom and bust in real time as, as someone kind of watching the asset just seems to provide a huge amount of confidence that, man, if this thing can crash 80% and we just saw you know 90% of the people who bought it kind of swear off of it forever because they were you know, chasing momentum and buying the top. And it survived that. It didn't just survive, but continues growing, continues, uh, the ecosystem continues building in every possible way. Um, that, you know, that, that's what really kind of uh, makes a lot of people believers. So I basically in, in heading into- Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. ecosystem continues building in every possible way um, that, you know, that that's what really kind of uh, makes a lot of people believers. So I basically in, in heading into 2016, personally, I had a little bit of Bitcoin. I was interested in it. Um, in 2016, uh, I was at, I had left 
Susquehanna, I was no longer a trader. I was now an investor. I, I worked for an endowment, University of Chicago, $8 billion endowment. I was a mid-career portfolio manager slash risk manager there. And um, late 2016, I just saw the right people starting start to get interested in Bitcoin. My own knowledge of it was kind of compounding. Like, you know, you, you learn a little bit about- uh, well, Okay, so talk me through that. At that point, what was it? Because look, all of our frameworks have changed over time. So let's go back to you in 2016. What do you think this asset is at that point? I thought of it as very much, I think, what we think of it as today, just, just with less confidence and, and, and more speculative. So I thought um, this is a competitor. Well, I, I guess I say what we think of it today, but certainly that there, there's room for discussion around that. Um, to me, it, it never made sense as a payment rail. Uh, some of the early people, not, not everyone, but some people pitched Bitcoin very early on as this is going to replace Visa, because you save 2% on credit card transaction fees, which never made any sense to me. That's no new technology gets adopted because of 2% savings, right? There's a huge friction to adopting new technology. So um, the pitch that resonated with me was really um, the offshore banking analogy. So the offshore banking system is 20 to 30 trillion, and that incorporates a lot of different use cases. But basically, every billionaire around the world and every S&P 500 company has some assets diversified across jurisdictions. And even if you're law-abiding, and even if you expect to uh, eventually be fully exposed to the legal system, you still want your day in court, right? If you're Amazon and you have all of your, ba your, your bank balances in a single bank in New York State, then one judge pre-trial can freeze your bank and suddenly you're insolvent. Suddenly you can't make payroll on Monday. So by having assets across jurisdictions, you give yourself a chance to make use of the legal system and appeal. And you can maintain your lifestyle, your business while that process happens. So the question I asked uh, was, and, and I, this wasn't, I wasn't a discoverer of this analogy. Um, it's what if everyone could access the offshore banking system from their phone with no friction and no minimums? And my answer was, yeah, I think a lot of people, even, even people who only have $10,000 to their name or less, they would love to have $1,000 in the offshore banking system so that it can't be demonetized. It's happened in India, so it can't be confiscated by a corrupt politician. If you're a Hong Kong dissident, so your bank account can't be seized uh, by the Chinese government, right? We, as, as Americans, we sometimes take for granted that we have a pretty strong legal system here, right? For the most part, things are pretty fair. Not perfect, but pretty fair. But to many people around the world, um, they have to fear arbitrary confiscation by local politicians, local police officers, so I thought, um, you know, there's at least a $30 trillion addressable market here, probably much larger. Bitcoin is competing to capture a meaningful portion of that. So my view was, hey, if Bitcoin succeeds, this is easily 100x from the levels it was at in 2016. And I can't really handicap it, but I think it's got a good shot. Because it's interesting, because I came in, I mean, different people come in from different ways. I came in almost entire, entirely different, well, entirely differently, partially differently, because I was in Spain during the... European crisis, and we almost lost our banking system. And we'd just gone through 2008 and realizing that when a banking system goes down, nobody knows who owns the assets. And then when somebody explained blockchain and Bitcoin, I'm like, oh my God, so we can solve custody, rehypothecation, and we can also have an asset that can protect us. And that's kind of what started me down the whole rabbit hole. So go back to 2016. So 2016. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I was kind of, uh, I was gaining conviction and I gained conviction also as a trader that we were basically about to have a, a parabolic growth period. And I had higher conviction in that than probably anything I ever have as a trader. And it was, that really arose just because I saw kind of the right people learning about it. And, and basically everyone who learned about it was interested and eventually bought some. You know, it was almost everyone. And so you, you could see the ripples of knowledge and understanding. And, you know, I was seeing uh, basically other people at the University of Chicago Endowment buy, including managing directors. And they were buying small amounts at first and then more. And um, it was just clear to me that absent something changing, there's adoption happening. And, the, and these, these adoption curves are just going to, these ripples of adoption are going to continue spreading out to more high net worth individuals, more, you know, I, I, was, I was having some friends who you'd call retail, get interested, learn more, start buying meaningful amounts. Um, so I became very convicted that this was going to grow probably very fast. And then I started thinking about it from the endowment perspective. You know, I wanted, I, I, I was a, a good employee or tried to be and, and wanted the endowment to benefit. Um, so I started doing educational seminars kind of internally. I, I wasn't naive. Uh, getting an endowment in 2016 or 20, early 2017 to buy Bitcoin, I knew was 
a, t a tall order, right, would take time. And so that my hope was, hey, maybe without me, this happens in 18 months or 24, maybe I can move that timeline up by six or 12 months with education. And uh, so I did some kind of internal educational meetings. Uh, I converted a lot of my colleagues to personally buying crypto assets. Um, but it was obvious that the endowment itself was still very far away, that the operational and, bureau and, and largely, frankly, the bureaucratic hurdles to owning uh, cryptocurrency were still pretty high. It hadn't yet, in early 2017, it didn't yet feel validated. You didn't yet have enough, you know, gray haired, trustworthy brands in, in traditional finance say it's OK. Uh, and the framing was very much, hey, if we put even 10 base points into this and we lose it, are we going to look foolish? That was the concern. It wasn't the risk because the risk of it going to zero, that's a sizing question, right? As a portfolio yeah. manager, yeah. Totally. it shouldn't. Uh, it's an, op it's an option of that. It's just an option. And yeah. you're an option trader and you understand that, you know, at that point in its cycle, it was just an option still. Yeah, absolutely. But and, and but career risk is a very real thing when you're talking about institutional allocation. And so it wasn't, oh, what if it goes to zero, we lose 10 basis points. It was, if we have 10 basis points in it, we lose that, we're going to look foolish. And, and maybe we face awkward questions and our, our judgment is questioned, were we proper fiduciaries, all of that. So I realized it was going to take time on the institutional side, but I saw the high net worth individuals retail coming in. Um, the, the one other angle, I talked about the offshore banking angle, but the other angle that brought me to it was uh, the one that's near and dear to your heart, which is um, dollar depreciation and fiat depreciation generally, which is something that when the 2008 financial crisis hit, I was a follower at the time, ironically, of Nuri Rubini. I was a big fan of his at the time. I've read many of his books. And um, I was a believer that eventually all of the money printing happening is going to cause the depreciation fiat. And I listened to the right people at the time who said this is going to take a long time. Right. So there were people in 2008, 2009 who predicted imminent inflation because of the money printing. Smarter people or more experienced people said, no, no, the force of this crisis is so deflationary, it's going to take years. But basically, in 2009, I said to myself, at some point in the next decade, I'm going to want to get out of fiat and I want to start looking for what the best hedge is or what the best alternative is. And then and I didn't I didn't it didn't click for me in 2011 when my friend mentioned Bitcoin. Right. I, I didn't make the connection. But then in maybe 2014, 2015, I made the connection that I could easily see this being the asset that becomes kind of a shelling point that people galvanize around as the explicit bet that central banks around the world are just printing tons of money. Um, so that was the other angle. It was, it was the seizure resistance of the offshore banking system, but also the depreciation resistance of having a fixed emission curve. So um, 2017, I'm at the endowment. It becomes clear that the endowment's not going to invest in the very near future. So uh, I met my co-founder, Matthew. Um, we looked at the financial landscape, and basically there were a few crypto investment firms at the time, not, not very many. Most were basically being run out of apartments. And we said, you know, there's kind of a gap in the market. We think we can provide something of value. Let's launch a crypto investment firm. So we did that and launched in August 2017. Okay, that's a terrifying time to launch, right? So you, you launch, you get the cash drag immediately. Every time you get cash in from investors, you can't catch up with the market, then it collapses. So how does that feel, right? You've set up a new firm, you've risked your career now, and now the damn thing goes down every day. Um, I, I actually consider us very fortunate in the sense that we knew we had to race to launch. Uh, my co-founder and I, we decided to launch, I think it was um, May 1st. And that would, you, you think about the timing, to launch, we launched August 15th. That's one of the fastest hedge fund launches in history. And that was not accidental. We were working 19 hour days in parallel to, to make that happen. And when I was telling my co-founder every day, we made the decision to launch Bitcoin with, I think, $1,500. I said, Matt, I said, Matthew, I'm looking at the charts. The next stop is 4,500. And it's almost a straight line there. And I said, I think we're there in two months. We have to launch. We have to capture this. And we were trying to launch August 1st. It took us a little bit longer than we were hoping. Literally, the night we launched, Bitcoin was at $4,400. While we were waiting to launch, it had gone up 3x. And so almost immediately after, we had the China bans Bitcoin scare. Bitcoin fell to 3,000. And that was painful because we we aggressively deployed because we were bullish. Um, and but but I consider us very fortunate that we were able to ride the, the wave of the rest of 2017. And yeah, even though we only had five months of a bull market, it was a hell of a five months. Uh, and that enabled us to really establish ourselves as a firm that could then survive the winter. What kind of investors did you find originally? So you're two madmen with this idea. Everyone's like, we're not going to touch this with a barge pole. But you managed to attract a bit of capital to start with. Who and how? 
what kind of people and how? Yeah, our initial investors were largely from the VC world. Uh, probably unsurprising. Um, we, we frankly didn't even pitch institutions like pensions. We knew that they were a ways away, and we thought the best way for us to eventually uh, have them allocate is just launching and, get, and generating good returns and generating a track record. And then we'll talk to them in a year when they're ready. Um, so it was largely VCs who very naturally think about investments as options, right? To a VC, you don't need to, it, a VC is willing to accept the zero, yeah. right? So it was largely VCs uh, and some high net worth individuals. Um, and, the, and the dollar amounts in this industry are pretty small, right? But even today, the dollar amounts managed by all funds in the space are almost trivial by traditional standards, right? In aggregate, I don't know what the number is, maybe it's $4 billion today at most in aggregate. Um, so, you know, you're talking pretty small dollar amounts, um, but, but very meaningful when you have the volatility as well as the alpha opportunities. This is not an asset class where you need to be managing $10 billion to be able to generate a meaningful income, right? These are not corporate bonds we're trading. Um, and, and I'd say, I think my, while, while you know, while I'm, I'm not gray haired and I'm certainly not viewed as experienced in the traditional financial sense where you're normally 50 if you're, you know, a veteran hedge fund manager, um, in crypto, we were kind of the mature people in the room in the set. Like we were known early on in the crypto world as the guys who wear suits. And it's funny. I never wore a suit in my earlier career as a, as a trader. I wore shorts and sandals at U Chicago. We dressed pretty casually. I put on a suit for crypto because I realized that that's kind of our role. Like I'm not a cryptographer. I'm not an engineer. I can't be the, the, the kid in the, the, the genius kid in a hoodie. What do I bring to the table? What do I, and, and for allocators, it was, we weren't pitching the moon. I didn't tell people this is guaranteed to take over the world and Satoshi is a time traveling AI from the future and uh, Bitcoin is gonna be a hundred trillion dollars, it's inevitable. That wasn't our pitch. Our pitch was, we came across, I think, and very deliberately pitched ourselves as mature, responsible, sober managers who see an inefficient market. So uh, part of the pitch was, even if you think that Bitcoin is tulips, they're very inefficient tulips that we can generate a lot of alpha on through active trading strategies. And do you think that being an option market maker in your past, just having the ability, the understanding of how to trade options get, gave you an understanding of how to trade this as an asset? Because it, it trades more like an option in terms of vol or vol or whatever, whichever way you want to look at it, you know? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. There's some asset classes where you don't need to think about regime shifts that much. You don't need to think about, it's, it's really about precision, capturing every basis point. And then there's others where the volatility is more than 100%. And as you said, it trades like an option. And so that's the right way to think about it. And um, so absolutely. Um, and frankly, my options training background, I kind of think about everything in life as an option, you know, much much to the dismay of, of friends, family, and even romantic interests at times when uh, I'll give a probabilistic answer to questions that probably didn't, didn't warrant it. Um, <laughs> So I, I'll say something that a key thesis of mine since day one, uh, and, and for people who are just buying and holding Bitcoin, this doesn't apply, but for you know funds in the space and traders, um, my number one rule was always don't blow up. And that may sound silly and trivial, but uh, we've seen a lot of uh, colleagues, competitors blow up, even in bull runs where they were right. You know, it, like there, there are a number of crypto funds that blew up this year for being too bullish on Bitcoin which is crazy because Bitcoin's up 100% this year. How do you blow up being bullish on an asset up 100%? And the answer is even with Bitcoin up 100% this year, it had a uh, you know 65%, 70% peak to trial drawdown. And so if you had leverage, you know maybe you got liquidated and taken out of the game. And so my thinking is always scenario-based and always what are the tails? And, and it's not that we need to optimize for the tails, but we got to make sure we can survive that. Yeah, it's the implicit risk reward that every option trader understands, right? That's all, I mean, I, I came out of that industry as well, and that's how I couch all of this and any, anything I do is I think of the same thing. What's the discrete amount of risk you're taking and what is the reward for taking it? So going back to 2016, the market peaks, do you not now think, why have I done this? Am I the stupidest man alive as the market keeps going down? And eventually, I don't know, what was the pullback? 80 something percent, isn't it? Yeah, a little over 80%. Um, no, uh, I never, it, so it was such a part of my mental model of what crypto and Bitcoin are that it wasn't, I was surprised that people were surprised. So for example, like I, I went on um, uh, some some kind of like, you know, CNBC type talk show and they're like, all right, Bitcoin fell 80%. Does that mean, you know, do you no longer believe in it? And I said, 
it's an asset that routinely falls 80%. I, I invested in it knowing that it's fallen 80% four times in the past. I haven't learned anything new. Like this is an asset that has these boom bust cycles uh, more extreme than most asset classes because it's so nascent. Um, and because it's all, the intrinsic value is so um, uh, network effect driven. So as Bitcoin is more valuable, it's more valuable because it's more liquid, it's more useful as a store value. So all of that contributes to just this kind of boom bust cycle. So no, I, I didn't think I learned, I didn't learn anything new by the bust, by the bear market. Um, when we launched in August, I told my co-founder at some point in the next year, we're, we're going to enter a bear market. It's probably going to be two years long and Bitcoin's probably going to fall 60 to 90%. And we have to survive that. Like that was part of the plan. Now, I'm not suggesting that I timed it perfectly. I didn't. Um, I'm not suggesting that we knew exactly when it was hopping and bottoming. We didn't. But that basic pattern was was part of how we were, you know, f from the day of launch. I, it, when we talked to potential investors, I literally told every, every single potential investor, um, you should expect that this asset class will at some point in the future fall 80%. And not, and I don't mean this is hypothetical. Like it will happen very likely in the next three years. But you say that to them, but when it happens, investors go, "Well, well, well, I didn't expect this." And you're like, "No, but I told you." A, a, a great point. That it's one thing to talk about in the abstract; it's another to live through it. Um, certainly, those two are very different things. Uh, I can say I think the VC mindset, which is you make an investment for ten years and you're and you're ignoring short-term volatility, was hugely helpful to us. If we had had an investor base of pensions that are re-underwriting investments every quarter, uh, it might have been very tough to, to stay alive as a business. But no, we, we had a fantastic investor base that really understood what they were in, maintained conviction. Uh, my and my team's conviction never wavered. It was a question of just how low is the bottom, what's the right timing. But we, we literally felt like we learned nothing new in the decline. So, okay. So now, how does your how is your thought process evolved since when you first started this. Yeah, it was a Bitcoin world. Then by 2016, it became a race amongst a number of different protocols. And the ICO boom came in the middle of that. Were you participating in all of that or were you just Bitcoin only at that stage? Yes. No, no. We, we participated. Um, I personally um, had tentatively and, and without great understanding, but I had in 2016, I in 2015, I owned Ethereum. Uh, I participated in the uh, Decred airdrop. Um, so that was before we we launched the investment firm. Um, so yeah, we've been I had you know been looking at ICOs personally um, as an investment firm. We participated you know in everything basically. Um, my view on this hasn't actually changed all that much, and that's not. I always question that because I, I like updating to new information. I like admitting that I was wrong. I'm very you know I take pride in that. Um, my mental models on this hasn't changed that much since uh, 2016, 2015, really, which is that uh, here's a real simplification. Um, most new technology competes as new technology, which means it's competing on features and efficiency. And early front runners often are leapfrogged. Very, very often the first, first leader in a new sector, a new industry, a new technology, they get leapfrogged because there's so much innovation happening that it's not about having that first patent or that first breakthrough. It's about the winner is going to be determined by the 10th patent or, you know, um, Bitcoin's the exception. So uh, I think my mental model on this is somewhat similar to say legacy banking where JP Morgan, we're very confident JP Morgan's going to exist next year. Why? Well, they get found guilty of criminal activity basically every year. They get, they get slaps on the wrist for engaging money laundering, fraud, facilitating narco trafficking and worse. But we know they're going to survive that because they're so big and they're not going to get shut down. They'll get a slap on the wrist. We know they can survive a losing year because investors will assume they'll still be around. And so investors will backstop liquidity problems. You know, in 2008, people like Warren Buffett come in and say, I know you're going to be around in five years. I'm willing to extend bridge loan type financing. Um, we know they're systemically important. So it's not JP Morgan is not competing. If you have an upstart bank that says we're undercutting JP Morgan on fees by 5%. You know that doesn't threaten JP Morgan. They're not competing on features. They're not competing on tech. They're competing on a whole bunch of other kind of uh, things that are many of which are directly tied to their longevity. I think Bitcoin's the same. Um, Bitcoin is it. Bitcoin's moat is uh, is the creation myth, which is we have a pseudonymous creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's incredibly powerful, hard to replicate. Uh, a really critical one is if we're trying to get people. Uh, if we're saying that you should consider storing millions, billions of dollars of wealth in this code, which could be which could be buggy, how do you have confidence that newly deployed code is, is bug free? 
a, an audit won't do it, right? If, if you tell me that uh, you know a new project is launching and they were triple audited and they've got 50,000 lines of new code, I'm assuming there's bugs in it. So the fact that Bitcoin has had relatively unchanged code for more than 10 years now, and, and there have been some changes, but especially as time has gone on, it's pretty ossified. So in the last four years, the code changes are quite minimal. And the process of updating the Bitcoin core client code is so rigorous and so conservative that basically there's a security moat that a new protocol tautologically can't, can't tackle because anything new is new by definition. And so a key element of Bitcoin's moat is the code has been around empirically tested for, for more than a decade. And that gives us tremendous confidence that I'm willing to have a huge amount of money stored as Bitcoin. And it's very tough to leapfrog that because time, basically you need a long period of time where the code has basically a bug bounty. There's money at stake and it, and it survives. Um, and then lastly, the shelling point around the inflation, around the emission curve, uh, and the fact that we have such a strong social consensus and, and it's a tested social consensus. In other words, in 2010, 2011, if we were debating how, how, how much confidence can we have in this 21 million coin limit? How do we know the protocol won't be hard forks? We could have made some arguments, but now we have a decade of data, right? Now we can say, well, there were some hard forks attempted. Uh, they failed. Um, they failed spectacularly, that, even though... That really threw me off in 2017. I'm like, I don't understand this. Is this like a, you know... Um, it, it, it didn't compute to my mind in financial market terms what the hell this was. And I got out because of it. What did you think when you saw those forks coming at first? So I thought it was inevitable that we would get forks. Basically, as soon as I understood the kind of mechanics and, and had a rough idea of, of, of the social consensus, I thought there's certainly going to be forks at some point because um, people are going to want different things and people are going to, there's potentially a monetary reward to successfully leading a fork. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I knew people would attempt it. Um, I didn't know exactly how you know, 2x would play out. Um, I did think, though, that it would be accretive. So I'm, I'm thinking about 2017 heading into the fork, uh, yeah. where I was long Bitcoin heading into the fork. And my thinking was, um, basically, you have something very contentious right now. It's somewhat similar to a conglomerate like a Honeywell, where you have a shareholder base that's tearing itself apart, and you have management pulled in two different directions. And where you can have a spinoff or a, a some kind of division of the company that potentially is accretive, because now you've got equity holders on both sides who are happy with what they own, and you've got management that is better aligned with their equity holders, and you've got the ability for specialization. So you end up with a more homogenous user base and ownership base. You end up with uh, decision making that is more aligned, that is more that can be faster, more consistent. Um, and that's what we saw. So if you own Bitcoin before the fork compared to two weeks after, you actually benefited because basically BTC didn't fall in value, but BCH had some value, um, which wasn't surprising to me. Uh, I, I was very confident that the forks that didn't understand the core value proposition would ultimately do poorly. So the pitch that, um, and this is something I, I've always had a very strong view on that I think has been basically verified empirically, which is it makes no sense to try to optimize Bitcoin as a payment rail because Bitcoin is a terrible payment rail. If you're trying to build a really good payment rail, you don't send every transaction to 100,000 nodes in duplicate. That's totally inefficient and unnecessary for a coffee purchase. And, and the, basically, Bitcoin is obsolete technology that was not optimal from the start for any given thing. It's not good tech in this, if you're evaluating it from an efficiency perspective, but that's also a selling point. Basically, it's, it's stability and it's obsolescence and it's um, basically stability at the protocol level, at the governance level, and at the code level uh, is its selling point. And so we will have other protocols that arise, that continue to arise, that are optimizing as a payment rail. They're much, much, much more efficient by construction than Bitcoin in every way, including the ledger itself. Like, I don't know if blockchains are optimal, right? We're going to have other types of distributed ledgers that may be better, um, but none of that matters to Bitcoin because you can get all of those features and functionality on other layers. So we have Lightning Network, whether or not that ends up being the winning kind of protocol. What's happening now, the big theme trend, and this isn't new, but now we're, for the first time ever, we're really seeing it start to get implemented in practice, is interoperability across chain. This is an old idea. Uh, in 2017, you were the first ever atomic swaps on mainnets. Uh, so Decred, Litecoin, Bitcoin did atomic swaps across them. And an atomic swap, uh, for listeners who may not be aware, is 
a cryptographic signature on, on two chains or more that with no intermediate or third party enables a transferring of value across blockchains. Uh, in 2017, they were proven to be doable, but the UX was terrible. They're very hard to implement. So now we're, we're entering a world where we have layer zeros like Polkadot launching that will enable connectivity across many layer ones. What do you mean by, what do you mean by layer zero? Just to explain to people. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the person to get the textbook definition on this, but um, so uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin are layer ones um, where you have the actual blockchain and network that is supporting the transactions and the communication. With a layer zero, the idea is that that layer is not meant to be the payment rail the way Bitcoin layer one is. Um, it's meant to hold the blockchains uh, to coordinate communication between the blockchains that will actually support those transactions. So the layer zero is explicitly meant only as a ultimate settlement layer. Yeah, okay. Um, and but, so that's one possible way to get interoperability, but there's many others. Uh, so we're getting scaling via things like plasma chains, state channels, and other types of side chains. We're getting um, uh, other types of bridges between, some of them are consensus type bridges. So for example, there's a layer two on Ethereum called Matic that is its own blockchain and consensus layer and basically says, um, we're going to be a faster, less secure Ethereum for things like games, and then we'll settle to the Ethereum network. Um, the point of all this is just to say, we have to separate the protocol from the asset. So Bitcoin, the asset today, is transferable across every other blockchain. And we see that in practice. So wrapped Bitcoin, trade on Ethereum every day. There's something like $5 billion of Bitcoin on the Ethereum network. But, I mean, don't tell the Bitcoin maximalists this, they'll kill you, I mean, because, you know, there's, as you say, it's basically the, the, the internet of value and interoperability has to happen where we can transfer everything around. We don't need to care what blockchain it's on, what protocol it's on or how it's done. But people are such purists about this. They're like, it can own, there can only be one. It's, it's like, I don't get it. Because as you say, I'd love to transfer my Bitcoin anywhere as I do with my email. Yeah, and I actually think that Bitcoin maximalists should be welcoming of this because Bitcoin maximalists are trying to optimize Bitcoin as a protocol and an asset for some specific use cases. And that opt and basically for, they're optimizing for security and stability. And that is directly at odds with usability, with efficiency. So without other layers and without other chains, there would be immense political pressure on Bitcoin to evolve and change in ways that Bitcoin maximalists don't want. So by having, and, and that would come in the form of, among other things, forks. And forks are a little bit dangerous. So when Bitcoin hard forks, we, we, we kind of left off in the conversation on the hard forks. The one thing that I think is relevant to note is when you have two forks of the same protocol that use the same uh, hash algorithm, the both, so in Bitcoin's case, the, if, if, every, if both forks use SHA-256, you have some potential game theory concerns. It's basically inherently un, unstable and unsustainable. And the reason is, the minority chain, by definition, is insecure. Because if you're if you're Bitcoin Cash running on SHA-256 with, with no special, so Bitcoin Cash has evolved and added some things like checkpointing into their code to deal with this. But basically, the miners of the larger chain can, for two hours, shift their hash power to attack the minority chain, and it's a free attack. They don't actually lose anything. They have no skin in the game. Because if they attack, say, Bitcoin Cash and destroy it, then their hardware still has value because it's still useful to mine Bitcoin, to mine B BTC, right? So um, the, the a premise, where does proof of work security come from? Uh, my view, and I, I, I think this is pretty frankly obvious, although there is some debate around it, is today at least it comes from having skin in the game in the form of sunk cost hardware, hardware that is not repurposable. So if I'm a miner and I control 51% of Bitcoin hash power, it's against my selfish interest to do any kind of attack on Bitcoin because I'm sitting on $6 billion of ASICs that I can't use for anything else. So if I attack Bitcoin and I make $100 million by attacking it, I, and my hardware devalues by 50%, I lose $3 billion. But if I can attack a different chain, and let's say I go short, I short sell the asset on that chain using derivatives, using spot borrowing, I can do that attack basically for free. And I, I, I have all this hash power, but I don't really have any skin in the game in that, on that other chain. So, um, so my point of all this is, you don't want innovation and features added to Bitcoin via hard forks because that introduces some of these game theory concerns. 
you want it happening via other protocols with their own tokens and their own incentive structure. Because then, uh, then what the Bitcoin maximalist can say is, hey, this you Bitcoiner who's whining that, that the transaction fee is $25 and you can't you know, use Bitcoin for the things you want to, wrap it and put it on Ethereum and use it that way. And that way we're not affected by it. Our security is untouched. And also it plays into the strength. If we are truly building a new financial system, you know, I, I've been arguing this for a while that the Bitcoin is pristine collateral. It's perfect to build the foundation stones. And with interoperability, all of these things can coexist, but Bitcoin becomes the collateral layer. It becomes the base layer of everything, essentially, in monetary terms. Um, and I think, you know, people haven't really got their heads around that yet, that, that all of this is going to morph and blend into one thing. But different things will have different use cases and ETH will be used across various chains as well, which people don't really understand. Yeah, I agree. Um, th there's a, a broad set, you know, we're still exploring what tokens can be and, and they really form very different. Like one conversation that I sometimes have with maximalists is they'll basically say, you know, anything you're doing with any other coin could use Bitcoin. Even if it's a separate protocol, you could, for example, you could fork Ethereum and use Bitcoin as the payment on it to pay for gas, right? Uh, something like that. And my answer is, well, like there's some use cases that really clearly have nothing to do with Bitcoin or monetary uses. So for example, NFTs, digital art, digital collectibles. Um, there's some cases where you want a monetary asset, but you want to have control over it. You want it to be a distinct monetary policy from Bitcoin. For example, a game economy, right? If we're running World of Warcraft, you want different things out of your money than if you're running the global economy. So why would you have the same currency with the same monetary policy? So there's a lot of very obvious lower important use cases that need other tokens. And um, the question is kind of how far will that go? So this, get, this is a really interesting debate. What does the world look like in 10 years? How many base currencies can there be? Uh, what are the differentiators? Let, let me offer one lens that I've, I've used to try to think about this. So if you can get the same features on any asset with interoperability, if features are not a differentiator, so for example, is if privacy is not a differentiator because I'm going to be able to get Zcash level anonymity with Bitcoin eventually by using some form of atomic swap or ZK snark wrapping or some some way, which I, which I think is accurate. Basically, cryptographically, we know we can do this. So it's a question of how long until we can implement it. Um, in a world where features are not the differentiator, what is what 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 prevents us from just having Bitcoin or just having you know what what requires multiple assets? And there aren't that many answers that don't for that don't allow for conversion. So one is monetary policy. If you want your asset to have a different monetary policy than Bitcoin, it has to be a separate token. It has to be a separate asset. So we could imagine countries or uh, communities that have a specific purpose in mind, wanting an asset with a different inflation policy than Bitcoin for their local currency. It could be for a game, it could be for a community, it could be for a country, it could be as an airdrop for UBI. Uh, so that's one differentiator, different monetary policy. Another is regulatory status. So um, this may or may not matter due to some technical considerations, but here's a hypothesis. At some point, someone will launch a blockchain that specifically cannot be atomic swaps, that cannot be made anonymous. So a challenge, right? A, a potential problem is that basically every blockchain today can be fully anonymized. So Bitcoin is, is, is pseudonymous, the FBI loves it, the FBI easily tracks criminals. But at some point, that, that might not be true. Um, it'll be easy enough. The UX to use Bitcoin privately might get good enough. So there might be demand for a hyper-regulatory compliant blockchain and asset. Because uh, some governments may ban Bitcoin, let's say. Let's say China says they ban Bitcoin, but they're okay with this other third-party public cryptocurrency because it can't be anonymized. Um, those are kind of the only two. You know, when I hear you put this, I'm just thinking, well, this is the financial system we come from, but most people in this world came from technology. They don't really understand. So I'm thinking of you at Susquehanna, right? You're trading options. You're doing whatever you're doing. So what is Susquehanna? Susquehanna is cash in from investors, converted usually to T-bills and treasury bonds, which are then pledged, which could be Bitcoin, which are then pledged as collateral to allow you to have leverage at the prime brokers. <clears throat> then with that leverage, that's given by the prime brokers, you buy a number of different securities. And across Susquehanna, you're trading equities, fixed income, commodities, foreign exchange, all sorts of different things. And you're not just trading the underlying, you're trading the option. 
And all of this works together seamlessly and nobody even thinks about it. And that's basically what this is, right? The interoperability between all of that, we just take for granted. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's been amazing. We we see early early examples of this with DeFi, um, which is it's and frankly it's incredible how quickly that's grown. I mean, DeFi almost was meaningless a year ago. Uh, you had some of the products, but you had almost no volume, almost no interest. You know, you've had you had more than a hundred thousand people use Uniswap. That's a small number of people, but you know we're starting to get into real numbers here. A hundred thousand people actively using decentralized finance via specific DAP on Ethereum. Um, and there's obviously been a lot of problems with DeFi. There have been constant hacks. Uh, I would strongly advise basically anyone against viewing DeFi as anything other than uh, hyper-speculative in the sense that, sure, maybe it makes sense to be a staker or provide liquidity if you're hoping for a 40% return, let's say. You wouldn't touch DeFi smart contracts for a 4% yield, right? It's just the risk-adjusted return would be terrible. Now, over time, those contracts will be better tested, better audited. The game theory mechanisms will get more empirically. They'll, they'll, they'll both be made better and we'll also gain confidence in them empirically. Um, but it's, and I don't know, by the way, that Ethereum DeFi will ultimately be, maybe we'll have rival systems built on top of Bitcoin. Maybe it'll, it'll use Bitcoins as is starting to happen with wrapped Bitcoin in Ethereum DeFi. Um, but it shows what's possible and it shows how quickly people can adapt, can adapt to it and adopt it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree that the, it, all of the friction that we take for granted, as you said, traditional prime brokerage and that whole system, we don't even think about I didn't think about that as a trader. As a young trader, I'm like, this is the back office. They deal with all this stuff. You don't think, I mean, running a hedge fund, I never thought about, okay, how many T-bills do we have and how's it pledged and what le, what am I getting? And then realizing, again, like a firm like Susquehanna, they're trading literally tens of thousands of instruments, particularly when you're looking at a different option contract. Nobody thinks about it at all. It just kind of works on the traditional banking system. And there's no reason why the internet of value, per se, the digital asset network, just won't go that way. So there's no reason why you don't have to be a treasury bond trader to own treasury bonds, is the point, is you can be anybody at own treasury bonds because it's the collateral layer. I uh, totally agree. Um, I think we're going to see, we're likely to see Bitcoin grows use of as, as uh, you know, for collateral. I do think that's still a decent ways away as a primary use or, or point of spreading. At the moment, people aren't buying Bitcoin because it's useful as collateral because it is still volatile. So it's less volatile than it was years ago. This year, its volatility has been not that much higher than the S&P 500, but still way higher than T-bills. Where like we can, there, there, there have been points where Bitcoin vol now compares favorably to 30-year treasury, but it's a long way away from comparing with T-bills. Yeah, and I, and I don't think of it yet as that, but it's the... The point being is, you know, in this space, you have to live in the future, much like the macro space. What appeals to me is they're very similar, is you're, you're trying to assess the odds of a future state. And the future state seems like, OK, we've got this asset that offers almost, almost superior forms of collateral in every way, except currently the volatility. Now, does volatility disappear from the space as you get larger adoption? For sure. We've seen this a gazillion times right. before the financial markets. We, we kind of know how it plays out which is vol, vol collapses over time. And, you know, if the Bitcoin maximists are right and, you know, it's worth $100 trillion, well, the vol is probably 3% or 2%, you know. And I mean, that question doesn't work. I, I, I think a, another key component along the same idea is that separate from BTC being used as collateral, you also have the Bitcoin network as the world's most secure settlement channel, um, which might not be true yet today, uh, although... You could even debate whether it may already be true. Certainly from the perspective of an Iran or a North Korea, it's more secure than SWIFT, right? Where, where we know the U.S. can arbitrarily cut countries off from the global financial network. Um, but but that's that's the end game. That, and, and I think we're, we're not that far from there, that in five or 10 years, if you have a company in China and a company in the U.S. that want to basically escrow capital, right? Right now, if, 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 the US, if the U.S. company is doing business with a U.K. company, they can kind of trust the international legal system. But if it's U.S. and China, you kind of can't, right? U.S. companies have to deal with this all the time where they say, we have a contract with a Chinese company, but if they renege on it, will we be able to successfully sue a Chinese company in China or, or sue them in the U.S. and then enforce that verdict in China? And the answer very often is no. So easy to imagine that maybe in five years, two companies are basically settling their transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, even if they, and they could be using a different asset. They could be settling a yuan transaction, but trusting in the Bitcoin network security to escrow that value for them. 
Yeah, I mean, the other thing that was making me think, you were talking about a purposefully impossible to anonymize protocol. Now, that works very well for things like custody. So let's say if somebody builds a system like that, it becomes much like the DTCC or Euroclear are, but better, where that is where all the banks trust all their custody and settlement layer to work. And therefore, you don't want any nefarious players. You, you want complete transparency because there's already problems in those because they actually commingle accounts at the end, at the very end point. It's still a, it's still a bit of a swamp when it comes to who owns what. But to have a, a perfectly transparent blockchain for that, and then you can store your Bitcoin into that if you're a bank and the regulators will force it. And that's what I think, I mean, I'm even just from this conversation starting to get in my head around how none of this, what we think is going to exist, is going to be what it is, because it's all going to blend in some big mesh that we won't even see. And it feels like this is probably what the people who saw the internet coming back in about 93 realized that whatever you thought it was is not what it's going to be. Yeah, um, as an investor uh, where I'm tasked with trying to think about specifically where will value accrue, what do you bet on? Um, it, it's very tough because there are, there are obviously some things here that are brand new, right? And I don't want to make the mistake of just badly analogizing, but there are some, I think, useful metrics. Um, and, and similar to the, the, the question I ask of what can't converge, um, similarly, you know, what what are the forces that prevent, you know, we could say this with companies, for example, why isn't there a single internet giant company, right? Why do we have Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter uh, and, and Amazon? And does that ultimately converge to one company? Why, why not? What are the forces that kind of encourage specialization? Some of those are technical. So for example, um, a key discussion happening right now when it comes to things like DeFi and other layer ones that are in the process of launching like Polkadot or, or layer zero in that case, uh, a key question is, okay, we're going to have all this interoperability pretty soon, but what are the limits of it from a technical perspective? So for example, if Ethereum can talk to Bitcoin, can talk to, to Polkadot by atomic swap, uh, but there's some latency or there's risk and settlement or there's potential game theory attacks, that still incentivizes potentially two DeFi applications to be on the same chain on Ethereum, or it, or it incentivizes... Um, you know, two applications to be on the same parachain on Polkadot. So there's a technical element, basically having these things separate, what are the real, the analogy in the real world here would be, um, you know, 80 years ago, it was very hard to be a multinational company because even communication was hard, right? If you wanted to have communication between an office here and an office in, in Paraguay, uh, you were relying on once a day communications, right? Now we've got Zoom, we've got email, we've got easy instantaneous communication. So technologically, it's now trivial to be a multinational company. But as I said, we still have some legal hurdles. It's still hard to do business across some borders because we don't have full faith in the legal system. So um, there's the technical question, there's the economic forces of what incentives are there to, to you know, are there network effects? Are there anti-scaling, uh, anti sorry, and like diseconomies of scale? Um, so that those are the kind of ones I try to think about this. And my, my best guess, and it's a humble one, and it's very likely to change as we get new info, is that you do get Bitcoin where BTC is viewed as kind of the, you know, public cryptocurrency store value play. The Bitcoin blockchain is viewed as the most secure settlement layer. You then have a bunch of other proof of stake networks, um, probably not proof of work, but proof of stake that are successful because they target a, a niche. They target a specific community, a specific ecosystem that works wonderfully well as a smaller group. So an analogy here would be federalism. Um, it doesn't, I think many of us, well, this isn't consensus, but most of us would agree we probably don't want a single global government that makes every decision because the needs of a person in rural North Dakota are very different than the needs of a person in rural India, right? We want some element of local governance because we have uh, heterogeneous desires, right, as people. So maybe you have some level of international government, like we have international law, and then you have some big countries for the things that work for that size, but some element of local government probably always makes sense because people, you know, you have local needs, right? So I think we're going to get the same with cryptocurrency. Um, Bitcoin is that global government, international law, which means it has to be minimized. It has to be a very, very simple rule set that is optimizing for, for kind of the least common denominator. It's kind of like, what is the minimum everyone around the world can tolerate? 
But then you can have individual cryptocurrencies and networks and chains that are optimizing to be, say, a gaming platform that are only pitching themselves to be used by gamers. And maybe you don't need $10 billion worth of security, right? Maybe you don't need that level. Maybe you can optimize for speed over security. Um, one of the things, what is super interesting in this space, and um, we've never really seen it before in the financial world. Well, we have in technology stocks, but here's a space where the basic driver is incentive-based systems in terms of money, right? Money is the greatest incentivizer, one of the greatest incentivizers of all. Um, really? Here is a system where if you can create adoption, i.e. Metcalfe's law, you get rewarded with huge amounts of money. So it becomes extremely tribal because everybody wants to make their money out of it. But what it means is the whole space generates ridiculous alpha because anything that adopts the curve, and we saw that in a few internet stocks, but there is a real propensity when you talk about money, which is the biggest network of all, to be absolutely gigantic. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and to the credit of Satoshi and, and you know, the Bitcoin OG believers, um, they saw that potentiality very early, right? But I mean, it's not just in Bitcoin, it's in everything, right? In all of the tokens, in all of the protocols, in all of the platform, everything. They all have, it's not that Bitcoin just has Metcalfe's law, it's every part of the ecosystem, which is unfathomable amounts of money you can make in this. Absolutely true. Um, the flip side of that is people often falsely extrapolate that. So the, the joke among, say, a VC pitch deck, and this is true also in traditional, is where you, you've got an entrepreneur who says, uh, I'm going to take on Facebook. Total addressable market is a trillion dollars. If I have even a 0.1% chance of capturing that, I'm, what's the math? I'm a $100 million company today. Right. And, and you can have some faulty logic with that. Um, and I think in crypto, we've seen this, right? We, we have a lot of retail participation where people get very excited about the idea that, I mean, we've had networks that are unlaunched valued in the billions and the framing people use is often, well, I get that this thing is unlikely to win, but if it wins, it's a hundred billion dollars or more. Yeah. And the, there's actual value to be an option trader in all of this, right? Because options exhibit the same, as we talked about earlier on, exhibit the same kind of risk reward profile. So you don't need to be right. And VCs figured this out a long time ago is basically the option premium that VCs pay is underpriced versus the reward. So they get they generate alpha. And this space seems to be the same thing as long as you're broad and not concentrated. You can be concentrated in certain bets, but when it comes to the most speculative end of the arena, you have to be broad and not concentrated. Because something, if any of those bets hits Metzcalf's law with money involved, it's going to be worth hundreds of billions. That's a really, this is a really interesting topic that rarely gets, so the, the angle on this that we've been debating internally at Block Tower with our investment team is uh, a slightly more concrete form of this, but, but basically this question, which is we expect, so I, I think we're in something like the fourth inning of a fairly typical Bitcoin bull market and fourth inning in terms of time, but we, we haven't even, we just kissed the all time high, right? So the, the next innings, uh, a lot more to go in terms of price, right? Especially the last third of bull runs tend to be parabolic. So I think we have a lot further going price, but maybe we're, you know, call it 30, 40% of the way in in time. So um, if this bull market resembles those that came before, and I think it likely will, uh, the last third of the bull run, all coins in general are likely to outperform Bitcoin. And that's happened every time in the past. It tends to happen in traditional markets where you get, you know, basically lower quality, small caps, outperform quality. And the reason is people's risk tolerance grows. Um, they, it's animal spirits. People feel great. They generated, there's a greed element. They generate a lot. You know, Bitcoin goes up 5x. People are now rich. They're looking for their next 5x. And Bitcoin feels like it's going to be hard to give it to them. So you start rotating into lower quality assets, chasing that same high. And all the markets look the same, right? Emerging markets, they're all identical. Credit markets, they all go the same way. Yeah. So the question for us is, our counterfactual to beat, if we believe that, is a passive equal weighted index of all coins and potentially even of shit coins explicitly, right? So typically the last phase of a bull run is the worst stuff rallies. So the question is, can we be, if, so we would obviously be adding alpha with uh, regime identification and market timing, but should we bother with asset selection? Should we just, basically you're, what you said implied, the best way to approach this may be 
to buy an equal weighted basket of shit coins and or, or all coins or, or high quality. You know, I, I'm not trying to be like well, it depends uh, where you are on the risk curve. Right. And again, if you were if you were in an emerging market hedge fund and you're in this exact process, you do exactly the same process. You'd have your high quality alts. You'd have your OK, not sure about these. And this is a stinking pile of turd. Uh, you know, if the market starts to rally, this stuff's going to go up you know, 50x. And you can construct a very nice portfolio doing that, where you, again, using basic option, understanding of options, you don't have to pay a lot for it. But the upside's enormous. So I, my conclusion on this, which is, is just subjective, um, I think that doing it as from a trader's perspective, where the bet is not on what will ultimately accrue $100 billion of value with Metcalf, but the bet is on we're betting that over the next four months, we think low quality altcoins are going to rally. Doing the passive basket may make sense. I think that could be a very smart trade. I don't like it as a long-term investment. And here's no. why. Yeah, whether it works depends on kind of the ratio. So in a world where, and, and here's a difference between traditional markets and crypto, it's not fundamentally different, but it is quantitatively different, which is um, like, I, I'll use ICOs as an example. The ICOs prior to March 2017 were generally very high quality. There were some scams, but the ratio was basically, you know, I'm going to make up a ratio, call it one great project for every three scams, right? So maybe that's not a good ratio, but it's much better than what came after, right? And ICOs that launched after September 2017, it was like 20 scams for every good project. And so if you're in the world where there aren't that many scams, a passive approach works great. If you're in a world where almost everything's a scam, you can't do passive. So, so I mean, here's the point. Of, it depends where you are in the cycle. Because we do know that, listen, if you were to build a large portfolio of ICOs, token, tokens of any sort, right, that over time, if you try and forget the generating alpha by buying the worst stuff, we all know that, and so it can be a great trade, as you say. You're just dry, buying a broad, equally weighted portfolio of these look interesting, which is the VC idea, probably over the cycle, and maybe not this part of the cycle, does pretty well. Because we don't know what's going to win, as we've been talking about a lot during our conversation, is there's a hell of a lot of new stuff still to come. And we have no idea who's going to win in that game. But placing some bets, my guess is the risk reward still out, out does it. And again, that's not talking about the worst assets, which is, I think, a great trade. I had the same conversation with Dan Moorhead this morning. Mm -hmm. Dan's like, yeah, we're looking at exactly this. Is as Bitcoin dominance starts to go down, you start going further out on the risk curve to generate yeah. some really good alpha. Certainly a lot of traders are having that same discussion because we have been through prior cycles. It's a natural thing to think about. Um, and yeah, and then and now we're actually having a second order discussion, which is okay, we see some alt, you know, so two weeks ago there was like a mini alt season where you had some assets like Litecoin do well. And we were internally debating, like, this feels a little bit too early. How much of this is genuine retail buying versus traders like Dan front running retail? And the thinking is, of course, if too many people pile into low quality alts, expecting them to pump imminently because retail's coming in, but retail six months away, it's, then you get a pullback first, right? Then you're going to get a better entry in those people because those people don't actually want to be holding these bags indefinitely, right? They're hoping for a somewhat quick flip to retail. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I, I will say this. I think we, like when I look at the, you know, top 100 coins by market cap, I think we can pretty definitively say that 70 or 80 of them are worthless fundamentally. Um, I, I'm very humble that I don't know what will work but sometimes you can say something won't work because it's scam artists or the team is grossly incompetent or the underlying premises are just broken and faulty and there's no real hope to pivot to success. Um, there's some subjectivity even there because uh, what was a good example of this? Um, I, I'll use MakerDAO as an example. So like when MakerDAO was first, I think their white paper, God, I'm, I'm gonna say this wrong and get lambasted for it, but um, I feel like it was early 2017, but uh, I, I, I may be misremembering. And it had some critical game theory flaws. It was fundamentally broken as a um, kind of a, as a project. So the idea is you have the maker token, which helps support stability of DAI, which is meant to be an algorithmic peg stable coin. And looking at the white paper, like it couldn't work. You could say that definitively. Like this, there, there are some very, very simple game theory based attacks that can basically destroy this. But the team iterated and fixed it. 
You know, so the fact that something's broken at time zero, of course, doesn't mean that the team can't improve it and fix it. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying the maker's fully fixed. There's still some questions with it. But the specific things I'm talking about, they were fixed. So, you know, we do see that frequently as well. Uh, Bitcoin, when it first launched, had a critical inflation bug. In 2010, Bitcoin hard forked to fix a critical bug. Uh, so, you know, you could have said, oh, I, I read the code of Bitcoin in 2009 and this thing is doomed because it is a bug. You would have been wrong, right? Because things can improve and be fixed. Um, with that said, I personally wouldn't want to blindly buy 100 crypto assets. Um, I do think that with a little bit of work, I can eliminate 80% of them and dramatically increase my efficiency. And this is just to bring on to where I wanted to get to, is you and I came out of traditional finance. Almost all alpha is gone. Too much money, crushed volatility, brought down time horizons, and that led to almost no alpha. Really difficult to generate alpha and it's fleeting. So, you know, the machine's got the alpha for a while. You know, you're in an option market making firm. They had alpha for a while because they had better technology. And then Goldman bought uh, a whole bunch of them like spear leads and all of that. And that all disappeared. And it, it was just, there's no alpha. Um, so, you know, Macro's currently got alpha because it's kind of slightly longer term and we're in a macro world, but then macro dies once volatility of assets goes down. Here is a space where they're bringing in new securities by the day in the hundreds, of which you require to do fundamental bottoms up picking and homework to figure out what's what, right? So that's hard. And anything that's hard equals alpha. Mm -hmm. You've got this, as I said, this adoption effect that if you do find a good bet, it can be life changing. And then you've got the fact that there's no capital in the space, which is where you started with this and said, there is no capital in a highly volatile asset class with new instruments that are super complex and require a lot of homework. And it's moving so fast up the adoption curve at Bitcoin level that you you can have a mac macro bets as well. I mean, why bother in traditional markets when there's this much alpha? <laughs> That was my own conclusion. Why uh, kill yourself as a trader in corporate bonds or, or S&P 500 equity when you have this market? Um, so the only answers are, well, if you're running $100 billion, it's maybe just too small to play in. Um, you know, it, so there's a scalability issue of strategies, which uh, you know, does, doesn't really impact you until you're into probably, probably many billions of dollars. Um, that's kind of the only, oh, and well, the answer, the real answer is is really the psychological, bureaucratic, career risk one. Um, why aren't more traditional hedge funds like Citadel fully embracing crypto? And some of it is operational. Um, so well, I'll give you an example. The, uh, rail, the rails are hard for them still. It's really hard to be a hedge fund and do this because if you've got a bunch of, you know, and Citadel have got a more complicated corporate structure, it's really hard to get that all cleared away that you're basically going to hold a bearer asset. Yeah. So uh, using that exact example, uh, and this is something that a lot of people in crypto who, who don't come from finance don't get. Um, it is really hard even today for an institution to own actual Bitcoin. And that's why they're putting money in a Patera fund or a GBTC. Um, and and the, the yeah, well, actually, I'll, I'll go through it for in just 20 seconds. Uh, and I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, you know all this, of course, but... Um, uh, and, and you have a financially literate listener base, but for some people, it'll probably be novel, which is, okay, great. Uh, I'll use my endowment as an example. Let's say Chicago wants to own a billion dollars of Bitcoin. How do they own it if they're going to own it directly? Is it on a hardware ledger that held by the CIO? And then the CIO has unilateral access to a billion dollars, right? That's not how endowments work. You need controls, right? So then they say, um, oh, no, but they can use multi-sig. And, and then my next question is, Okay, who's running the process? On what software? On what hardware? You're asking an endowment to underwrite a series of security risks of the utmost severity, right? If there's a, a keylogger on that device physically, the money's gone. And they've never had to underwrite this kind of stuff, ever. That's not their business model. That's not what they do. Um, and I would actually go further and say that most things in the industry like, uh, like hardware wallets are not up to par yet. For example, Trezor, um, when we launched, we made we make use of a whole bunch of different kind of custody options. But one thing we used when we launched was Trezor. It, and then two months later, it came out that at DEF CON, people figured out how to hack it with a paperclip. Trezor was viewed at the time as the industry best practice. You know, this is a, and, and in no way is that a criticism of the team. It's, it was a great team at the time. It's still a great team. Uh, 
it, it just, that was viewed as the most trusted way to hold Bitcoin in the industry. And it turns out you can hack it in 20 seconds with a paperclip. So that's just the level of, you know, uh, that's not going to cut it for a pension. So it just, it's foreign, right? We need to come up with new processes and new methods for direct ownership. Because also, um, you know, as you know, you're in an endowment. Your job as a portfolio manager is to assess the risk of what you've got, right? And the risk for you is price, right? Is the price going to go up or down? At no point is your risk, is it going to get stolen from me from a gun to my head? 100%. That's your risk. You know how to price. So you can't price that. So in which case, everyone goes, I can't do it. And it's as simple as that. <laughs> it, totally. Um, using the, the Citadel example, so until I would say maybe this year, maybe last year, you couldn't really run a crypto trading desk in the traditional sense. In that, So when I was a trader trading uh, crude oil futures or treasury bonds, I might have access to trade $100 million of assets. I couldn't transfer them. I couldn't transfer crude oil futures to my personal account. I couldn't move treasury bonds, right? I didn't even, if you had told me, Ari, you, were just, you just traded a billion dollars of treasury bonds today, move one of them. I'd be like, I don't even know how. I don't even know, like, I don't even know. I, I didn't even know where our treasury bonds were custody. I didn't even know where they were. You yeah. know, I was just a trader in front of a screen. So crypto until basically this year, you didn't have anything to support a trading desk infrastructure for live trading. You had, you had custodians that might enable multi-party uh, authentic, uh, authentication with a slow process that might take eight hours for egress. You didn't have anything that was real time. Today, you have some basically very new platforms. Uh, so like one that we use is called Fireblocks, and that's used by a number of funds and exchanges in the industry. And what, what they are is basically a administrative wrapper that lets me give a junior trader trading ability without withdrawal ability. Or I can give my head of operations the ability to transfer our assets between two exchanges, but not to list a new address. Before Fireblocks, you couldn't run a modern trading, a modern firm, right? It, it basically, so, so practically speaking, what people did was either the principal did everything. So, you know, I do every transfer myself. Uh, which is pretty tough in a 24-7 market, right? Maybe that works for a four-person firm, but it, it doesn't scale. Or you're trusting all your individual traders with private keys, which is how most of the OTC desks work. And that might be okay for, for a startup hedge fund or an OTC desk where it's principal capital. It's not okay for a pension, right? You're not going to have a bunch of people who can independently take money. So it's, so it's getting much better. But Fireblocks, for example, I have only good things to say about them. I would highly recommend them to a someone in the industry. And I have no incentive, by the way, to say that. We're just happy customers. Um, but it's based on fairly novel cryptography. The, the cryptography itself that it's based on is called multi-party computation. And the version of it that they're based on is something like four years old, um, which is considered basically untested in cryptographic circles. Uh, and it's fairly new software that's evolving. And, you know, the point is, like, it's it's I view it as a very trustworthy solution for us. It's not at a pension level. That's another three years away. But, you know, and for you, the, you you've got this double-edged sword, uh, or two sides of the coin here, is one is you want the institutional money to come in because it's going to drive the asset prices. The other is you don't want it to come in because it's going to lower alpha when it does. Because right now you're in a sweet spot where it's liquid enough, where in a 2 and 20 structure or whatever structure, some incentive structure, you can make a fortune, right? This is the same, no, even better than this than the opportunity set Soros and those guys had in the late 60s, early 70s, where you get this incredible volatility of an asset class with incredible upside returns. And you can make a lot of money by making money. The whole hedge fund industry, in fact, the whole asset management industry has changed. Nobody cares about making money anymore. It's just about gathering assets because um, it's the only way. So you, you've kind of got this weird world where you kind of want it to happen. And you're like, oh, please don't all come in because you're going to take all of this ridiculous alpha away. And my guess is it's still a long way before the alpha goes. It just feels like this is still, we've got 10, 20 years before alpha goes out of this. I think it's a very long way. And I agree with everything you said. Um, and my model for this, it, it frankly is common sense, um, which is the things that you would expect to get arbitraged away the fastest do. So, uh, for example, in early 2017, you could manually do arbitrage across crypto exchanges. And the reason for that was kind of no one had bothered doing algos. Like it was just, you had very, very few algos running. Um, there weren't that many people, like crypto as a whole, like late 2016, all of crypto was a $5 billion asset class. 
the A plus quant traders at Citadel, like it, it wasn't even necessarily on the radar, right? A couple of them were doing it, but but not much, not much capital. Um, mid-2017, we as a firm, we were discussing what strategies do we want to, like, I viewed crypto as kind of a blue ocean where I said, okay, I've got my own trading skill set that I've gained over my years, which, which was somewhat broad. Uh, I was very much a jack of all trades, master of none, and that I traded treasury bonds and, and commodity ETFs and, and futures curves and electricity and, you know, a whole bunch of different things. And I, I was maybe okay at all of them uh, or some of them. Um, and so the thinking was like, it's not so much about what we do is what, what can we do? What should we do, right? Where do we want to allocate our time? We can hire, right? If, if we see a juicy opportunity and I'm not the right guy to trade it, we can hire someone to do it. So that was the mindset. And we said, should we do arbitrage? We see it there, right? It's, we can see it in the market. And our, our answer was, we're not going to invest in building an arbitrage engine, which would mean, you know, some level of, of hardware to be compete on latency, some level of software, sophisticated algos. Um, exchange, you know, being on many, many exchanges, managing the counterparty. It's operationally intensive because you want to manage your counterparty risk. And we said, we don't want to invest in that because we think, yes, it's there today. It's going to be gone in six months or a year. It's not a sustainable advantage for us. We're not experts in that. That's not in our blood. You know, we're never going to be the best in the world once it's competitive at ARPS. December 2017, the ARPS came back. And, and, and I literally myself manually clicking Coinbase to Gemini made a few million dollars on arbitrage, which is the dumbest thing, manually clicking on two US exchanges with basically zero counterparty risk. And I didn't intend to do it. It happened one day when um, I'm like, okay, I wanna buy some Bitcoin, where's the cheapest? And I had Coinbase and Gemini open. I'm like, wait, there's a $300 disparity, what the heck? So I was literally just buying on one, transferring, doing, I would do it once a day because the wire system would let me do it once a day. I'd recycle the capital. And over 30 days, it was worth, uh, you know, it was like effectively a 20% ROI on $10 million in 30 days. You know, non, that, that's the one month ROI, not annualized. Um, but but I, I still didn't want to invest in infrastructure because I knew it would go away. Um, so the pattern there is that even when things get argued away, when you get a massive flood of new capital, it overwhelms the existing market participants, the professionals, and you again get out even those old things that were argued away. In traditional markets, the equivalent might be in 2008 when the algo shut off, right? When the quant algos got their faces ripped off, suddenly strategies well, were. We also had it in, in March. Yeah. When, when basically everybody's. Um, um, there was a collateral shortage, everybody was out of the market, and before we knew it, the treasury market completely decoupled, which never happens because there was more arbitrage in that market than anything on earth. And it went. Yeah. Yeah. So but my point of all this was just, um, you know, arbitrage, the easy arbitrages to, to, to where there isn't meaningful counterparty risk, where there's not uh, operational hurdles, where you can onboard to the exchanges. Uh, unsurprisingly, right now, that's basically gone away, right? There's firms making money doing it, but they're competing on slim margins. But um, as you said, there's so much new that is constantly going to be new for the next decade that it's very hard to see. If you're a quant trader in crypto today, you might be in trouble in two years. Uh, you're at least going to be competing against some bigger players, you know, more sophisticated players. But if you're of the VC side, I don't think you're going to have any more competition because, yeah, you'll have some more VCs get in the game. But the ones who are getting in from scratch, they have a learning curve. You've been in the industry. You have the relationships, the knowledge, the experience. You know, um, something I, I, I was fond of saying in 2017, when we got asked this question constantly in 2017. Okay, guys, what are you going to do when Two Sigmas in the game or Rentech or Citadel or even the VC shops when, they're, when they were investing directly in bigger? And my answer was always, um, well, we're not going to be able to compete on the things that where they can just do exactly what they're doing on a new asset. So Rentech, CME, Bitcoin futures, we're not beating them in that game. Because it's, it's the, you know, all their same hardware, software, just looking at another asset. But when it comes to something like um, evaluating the probability of a hard fork and the value of the, of the forks, well, that requires, that's all about the relationships, a deep understanding of the communities and the incentive structure, a decent technical understanding, and even knowing what technical stuff matters, right? It's not about being the world's top expert in cryptography. It's knowing what practical technical elements matter in this question and who do I, what experts do I even talk to? Because we have access to the same experts that say Rentech would if they really devoted themselves. But I'd like to think that we would know what questions to ask and who to talk to, to flesh out, for example, um, what practically speaking is going to happen if there isn't replay protection on a hard fork, you know, trying to anticipate the, those kinds of things. What kind of game theory exploits are likely in a new DeFi launch? Well, that's this weird mix of game theory, community, you know, uh, consensus mechanisms, code review. So um, my view is kind of bring it on that 
uh, we, we will always be trying to look at kind of the next thing. And then five years later, it'll be our way. Great, we'll have already been on to the next thing. Yeah, and it's moving so fast that that's not going away for a while. Listen, Ari, fabulous conversation. Lots to think about. And I think we probably could have spoken for another couple of hours about all of this stuff. There's, there's so much. It's just, it's just a very rewarding space to look into because there is so much going on and there's so much speculation about where it can go and having to assess the probabilities is half the fun of it because you can get rewarded for it as well. 100%. Um, let me leave you with one line. Uh, that I think th this discussion may come out in, um, uh, I don't know, a week or so, uh, something oh, like that, yeah. um, December. So one thing that may shake people's confidence a little bit, it would be a very, very classic kind of, for the stage of the bull market uh, dip, would be, you know, you, you're seeing the headlines about um, new regulatory announcements that are on the horizon. Um, we're gonna get some real ones, almost certain. So uh, the Mnuchin discussions with G7, the yeah. internal discussions in the Treasury Department, very likely that we get something concrete from that that is likely to look scary. And I'm not saying that it won't be scary. Um, everything, based on my current understanding of what's being discussed, none of it is an existential concern or an existential risk. Uh, so a possibility is that maybe in the next two to four weeks, we get a meaningful dip. Not predicting that, by the way, but we may. And I hope that happens because I'll view it very likely as a large buying opportunity. Yeah, and I'm looking exactly the same way. And whether it plays out or not, who knows? But I just think from what I know, from my understanding is, if you impose some very clear regulation, a bunch of people are going to hate it, and the entire institutional customer base is going to love it. Because that's all they want, is the clarity of the regulation to say, okay, here's the definitive rulings on the stuff that we need. Once we get that, for me, huge buying signal. I agree. I think it's going to be a rocky road to get clarity. My guess is that the first wave are more uh, more confusing and abstract and the industry experts look at this, the guys at Coin Center who are, who are wonderful, that they're like, this literally, this contradicts itself and this is impossible to implement. It's impossible to enforce. It's, it's not clear what we have to do to comply with it. So my guess is that the first iteration is more in that camp and that's part of what will create some headaches and some negative headlines. Just kind of, it's scary when you look at legislation or, or regulation and it's like, it, it's not pop, like with the, um, uh, God, what was the New York state regulation? Um, uh, I'm blanking on the, on the name for the regulation that was like New York state specific and the letter of that regulation was impossible to comply with. It contradicted itself. You literally in a purely legalistic sense could not be compliant with New York state. And in practice, what happened was, you know, the GC at Coinbase talked to the regulators and said, what do you really want us to do? And they gave some answers. And, but that stuff creates so many headaches and, you know, concerns. Well, volatility is a feature of the space. So we just have to treat it as a feature and not a bug. All right, listen, great to speak to you. And uh, listen, catch up with you soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.